But as to the Tua de Danan, after they were beaten, they would not go under the sway of the sons of Maled, but they went away by themselves. And because Mananan, son of Lear, understood all enchantments, they left it to him to find places for them where they would be safe from their enemies. So he chose out the most beautiful of the hills and valleys of Ireland for them to settle in, and he put hidden walls about them that no man could see through, but they themselves could see through them and pass through them. And he made the feast of age for them, and what they drank as it was the ale of Goivnu the smith, that kept whoever tasted it from age and from sickness and from death. And for food at the feast he gave them his own swine, that though they were killed and eaten one day, they would be alive and fit for eating again the next day, and that would go on in that way forever. After a while, they said, it would be better for us one king to be over us than to be scattered the way we are through the whole of Ireland. Now the men among them that had the best chance of getting the kingship at that time were Bov Derg, son of the Dagda, and Ilbrech, son of Esrua, and Lear of She Fionache, the hill of the white field on Sleeve Fua, and Mir, the proud of Brilech, and Angus Og, son of the Dagda. But he did not covet the kingship at all, but would sooner be left as he was. Then all the chief men but those five went into council together, and they agreed to give the kingship to Bov Derg for the sake of his father, for his own sake, and because he was the eldest among the children of the Dagda. It was in She Femin Bov Derg had his house, and he put great enchantments about it. Cleach, the harper of the king of the three Rosses in Connacht, went one time to ask of his daughter in marriage, and he stayed outside the place through the whole length of a year playing his harp, and able to get no nearer to Bo or his daughter. And he went on playing till a lake burst up under his feet, the lake that is on top of a mountain, Loch Belshid. It was Bove Swineherd went to Derga's inn, and his squealing pig along with him, the knight Conair, the king of Ireland, melt with his death. And it was said that whatever feast that Swineherd would go to, there would be blood shed before it was over. And Bove had three sons, Angus, Artrach, and Ave, and they used often to be living among men in the time of the Fianna afterwards. Artrach had a house with seven doors, and a free welcome for all that came. And the king's son of Ireland and of Alban used to be coming to Angus to learn the throwing of spears and darts, and troops of poets from Alban and from Ireland used to be with Ave, and that was the comeliest of both sons, so that his place used to be called the Wrath of Ave of the Poets. And indeed it was a beautiful wrath at that time, with golden yellow apples in it and crimson pointed nuts of the wood. But after the passing away of the Fianna, the three brothers went back to the Tua de Danan. And Bovderig was not always in his own place, but sometimes he was with Angus at Bruna Boyne. Three sons of Lu Men, king of Ireland, Yoki and Fiecha and Rui, went there the one time, for their father had refused them any land till they would win it for themselves. And when he said that, they rose with the ready rising of one man, and went and sat down in the green of Bruna Boyne, and fasted there on the Tua de Danan to see if they could win some good thing from them. And they were not long there till they saw a young man, quiet and with pleasant looks, coming towards them, and he wished them good health, and they answered him the same way. "'Where you come from?' they asked him then. "'From the wrath beyond, with many lights,' he said. "'And I am Bov Derg, son of the Dagda, and come in with me now to the wrath.' So they went in, and supper was made ready for them, but they did not use it. Bov Derg asked them why it was they were using nothing. It is because our father has refused land to us, and there are in Ireland but the two races, the sons of Gael and the men of Jaya, and when the one failed us, we are come to the other. Then the men of Jaya consulted together, and the chief among them was Mir of the yellow hair, and it is what he said, Let us give a wife to every one of these three men, for it is from a wife that good or bad fortune comes. They agreed to that, and Mir's three daughters, Dwarin and Aoife and Alva, were given to them. Then Mir asked Bov to say what marriage position should be given to them. I will tell you that, said Bov. We are three times fifty sons of kings in this hall. Let every king's son give three times fifty ounces of red gold, and I myself, he said, will give them along with that three times fifty suits of clothing of all colors. I will give them a gift, said a young man of the Tua de Danan, from Rochlin in the sea. A horn I will give them, and a vat, and there is nothing wanting but to fill the vat with pure water, and it will turn into mead fit to drink and strong enough to make drunken. And into the horn, he said, you have but to put salt water from the sea, and it will turn into wine on the moment. 
a gift to them from me, said Lear of Sheaf Yanacha. Three times fifty swords, and three times fifty well-riveted long spears. A gift from me, said Angasog, son of the Dagda. A roth, and a good town with high walls, with many bright sunny houses, and wide houses, in whatever place it will please them between Rath, Kovtig, and Teor. A gift to them from me, said Alina, daughter of Morn. A woman cook that I have, and there is a geisha on her not to refuse food to any, and according as she serves it out, her store fills it up of itself again. Another gift to them from me, said Bovderg, a good musician that I have, fair twin, son of Trogan. And although there were women in the sharpest pains of childbirth, and brave men wounded in the early days, in a place where there were saws going through wood, they would sleep at the sweetness of the music he makes. And whatever house he, lay, he may be in, the people of the whole country round will hear him. So they stopped in Brunaboy in three days and three nights, and when they left it, Angus bade them bring away from the oak wood three apples, one in full bloom, one shedding its blossom, and the third covered with ripe fruit. They went then to their own dune that was given to them, and it is a good place they had there, and a troop of young men, and great troops of horses and of greyhounds, and they had three sorts of music that comely kings liked to be listening to, the music of harps and lutes, and the chanting of Trogan's son, and there were three great sounds, the tramping on the green, and the uproar of racing, and the lowing of cattle, and three other sounds, the grunting of good pigs with the fat thick on them, and the voices of the crowd on the green lawn, and the noise of men drinking inside the house. And as to Yoki, it was said of him that he never took a step backwards in flight, and his house was never without music or drinking of ale. And it was said of Fiacha that there was no man in his time braver than himself, and that he never said a word too much. And as to Rua, he never refused any one, and never asked anything at all of any man. And when their lifetime was over, they went back to the Tuadidanan, for they belonged to them through their wives, and there they have stopped ever since. And Bolv Derek had a daughter, Skanyev, of the Flower of Brightness, that gave her love to Kelcha in the time of the Fiana, and they were forced to part from one another, that they never met again till the time Kelcha was old and withered, and one of the last that was left of the Fiana. And she came to him out of the cave of Kruachan, and asked him for the pride price he had promised her, and that she was never able to come and ask for it till then. And Kulcha went to a cairn that was near, and that was full up of gold, that was wages earned by Conan and Mull, and hidden there, and he gave the gold to Bolv Derg's daughter. The people that were there wondered to see the girl so young and comely, and Kulcha so gray and bent and withered. There is no wonder in that, said Kulcha, for I am of the sons of Maled that wither and fade away, but she is of the Tua de Danan that never change and never die. And it was at Brunaboyn the Dagda, the red man of all knowledge, had his house, and the most noticeable things in it were the hall of the Morugu and the bed of the Dagda, and the birthplace of Kermit Honeymouth, the prison of the Grey Maka, that was Cucullin's horse afterwards, and there was a little hill by the house that was called the comb and the casket of the Dagda's wife, and another that was called the hill of Davila, that was the little hound belonging to Bowen. And the valley of the Mata was there, the sea turtle that could suck down a man in armor. And it is likely the dog to put up his cooking oven there, that Drumna, son of Lucher, made for him at Tabor. And it is the way it was, the axle and the wheel were of wood, the body was iron, and there were twice nine wheels in its axle that it might turn the faster. It was as quick as the quickness of a stream in turning, and there were three times nine spits from it, and three times nine pots and it used to lie down with the cinders and to rise to the height of the roof with the flame. The dog to himself made a great vat one time for Inga, his daughter, but she was not well satisfied with it, for it would not stop from dripping while the sea was in flood, though it would not lose a drop during the ebb tide, and she gathered a bundle of twigs to make a new bat for herself. But Gevla, son of Nuada of the Silver Hands, stole it from her and hurled it away, and in the place where it fell a beautiful wood grew that was called Gavla's Wood. And the Dagda had his household at Brunaboyne, and his steward was Dichu, and Len Linfjachlach was the smith of the brew. It was he lived in the lake, making the bright vessels of Fond, daughter of Phleas. And every evening when he left off work he would make a cast of the anvil eastward to Induin Nadesha, the anvil of the Desha, as far as the grave end. Three showers it used to cast, a shower of fire, a shower of water, a shower of precious stones of pure purple. 
But Turva, father of Goivnir the smith, used to throw better again, for he would make a cast of his axe from Tulach Nebella, the hill of the axe, in the face of the flood tide, and he would put his order on the sea, and it would not come over the axe. Corin was the best of the harpers of the household. He was the harper to the dog's son, Giancecht, and one time he called with his harp, Culture, one of the swine of Devron, and it ran northward with all the strength of its legs, and the champions of Connacht were following after it with all their strength of running, and their hounds with them, till they got as far as Kesh Corin, and they gave it up there, all except Njal that went around on the track of the swine till he found it in the oak wood of Tarva, and then it made a way over the plain of E and through a lake. And Nial and his hound were drowned in the following it through the lake. The dog did gave Corin a great tract of land for doing his harping so well. But however great a house the dog did had, Angus got it away from him in the end, through the help of Manannan, son of Lear, for Manannan bade him to ask his father for it for the length of a day and a night, and that he by his art would take away his power for refusing. So Angus asked for the brew, and his father gave it to him for a day and a night. But when he asked it back again, it is what Angus said, that it had been given to him forever, for the whole of life and time is made up of a day and a night, one following after the other. So when the Dagda heard that, he went away, and his people and his household with him, for Manannan had put an enchantment on them all. But Tihu, the steward, was away at the time, and his wife and his son, for they were gone out to get provisions for a feast for Manan and his friends. And when he came back and knew his master was gone, he took service with Angus. Angus stopped in Brunaboin, and some say he is here to this day, with the hidden walls all about him, drinking Goivnu's ale and eating the pigs that never fail. As to the Dagda, he took no revenge, though he had the name of being revengeful and quick in his temper. Some say it was at Tewar he made his dwelling place after that, but wherever it was, a great misfortune came on him. It chanced one time Corrigan, a great man of Connacht, came to visit him, and his wife along with him. While they were there, Corrigan got in his mind that there was something that was not right going on between his wife and Ev, one of the sons of the Dagda. Great jealousy and anger came on him, and he struck at the young man and killed him before his father's face. Everyone thought the Dagda would take Corrigan's life then and there in revenge for his son's life, but he would not do that, for he said that if his son was guilty there was no blame to be put on Corrigan for doing what he did, so he spared his life for that time. But if he did, Corrigan did not gain much by it, for the punishment he put on him was to take the dead body of the young man on his back and never to lay it down till he would find a stone that would be its very fit in length and in breadth, and that would make a, great st a gravestone for him. And when he had found that, he could bury him in the nearest hill. So Corrigan had no choice but to go, and he set out with his load, but he had a long way to travel before he could find a stone that would fit, and it is where he found one at last, on the shore of Loch Favel. So then he left the body up on the nearest hill, and went down and raised the stone, and brought it up, and dug a grave, and buried the dogda's son. It is many an ochen he gave when he was putting the stone over him, and when he had done that, he was spent, and he dropped dead then and there. The Dagda brought his two builders, Garvan and Iwil, to the place, and he bade them build a wrath around the grave. It was Garvan that cut the stones and shaped them, and Iwil that set them around the house till the work was finished. And then he closed the top of the house with a slab, and the place was called Hill of Elach, that is, the hill of size and of a stone, for it was tears of blood the Dagda shed on account of the death of his son. And as to Angus Og, son of the Dagda, sometimes he would come from Bruna Boyne and let himself be seen upon the earth. It was a long time after the coming of the gale that he was seen by Cormac, king of Tewar, and this is the account he gave of him. He was by himself one day in his hall of judgment, for he used to be often reading the laws and thinking how he could both best carry them out. On a sudden he saw a stranger, a very comely young man, at the end of the hall, and he knew on the moment it was Angus Og for he'd often heard his people talking of him. But he himself used to be saying he did not believe there was any such person at all. And when his people came back to the hall, he told them how he had seen Angus himself and had talked with him. And Angus had told him his name and had foretold what would happen with him in the future. And he was a beautiful young man, he said, with high looks, and his appearance was more beautiful than all beauty. And there were ornaments of gold on his dress. In his hand he held a silver harp with strings of red gold and the sound of its strings was sweeter than all music under the sky, 
and over the harp were two birds that seemed to be playing on it. He sat beside me pleasantly and played his sweet music to me, and in the end he foretold things that put drunkenness on my wits. The birds now that used to be with Angus were four of his kisses that turned into birds, and that used to be coming about the young men of Ireland and crying after them. Come, come, two of them would say, and I go, I go, the other two would say. It was hard to get free of them. But as to Angus, even when he was in his young youth, he used to be called the frightener or the disturber, for the plough teams of the world and every sort of cattle that is used by men would make a way in terror before him. One time he appeared in the shape of a landholder of two men, Riv and Yoki, that were looking for a place to settle in. The first place they chose was near Bregia, on a plain that was belonging to Angus, and it was then he came to them, leading his horse in his hand, and told them they should not stop there. And they said they could not carry away their goods without horses. Then he gave them his horse, and bade them to pull all they had a mind to on that horse, and he would carry it. So he did. But the next place they chose was Ma Find, the fine plain. That was the playing ground of Angus and Mir. And that time Mir came to them in the same way and gave them a horse to put their goods on, and he went on with them as far as Ma Darfthin. And there were many women who loved Angus, and there was one, Angi, daughter of Elkmer, loved him though she had not seen him. She went one time looking for him to the gathering for games between Kletach and she and Broga. And the bright troops of the she used to come to that gathering every Samhain evening, bringing a moderate share of food with them, that is, a nut. And the sons of Dirk came from the north, of the she Findabrach, and they went round about the young men and women without their knowledge, and they brought away Elkmer's daughter. There were great lamentations made then, and the name the place got was Kogaba, the nut lamentation, from the crying that was at the gathering. And Derbrin, Yoki Fedlek's daughter was another that was loved by Angus, and she had six fosterlings, three boys and three girls. But the mother of the boys, Dolv Garb, the rough, put a spell on them. She made from a gathering of the nuts of Kal Ohid that turned them into swine. Angus gave them into the care of Buchet, the hospitaller of Leinster, and they stopped a year with him. But at the end of that time, there came a longing on Buchet's wife to eat a bit of the flesh of one of them. So she gathered a hundred armed men and a hundred hounds to take them, but the pigs made away, and went to Bruna Boy and to Angus, and he bade them welcome. They asked him to give them his help, but he said he could not do that till they had shaken the tree of Targba, and eaten the salmon of Inver Umel. So they went to Glaskarn, and stopped a year in hiding with Derbren, and then they shook the tree of Targba, and they went on towards Inver Umel. But Maeve gathered the men of Connacht to hunt them, and they all fell but one, and their heads were put in a mound, and it got the name of Duma Selga, the mound of the hunting. It was in the time of Maeve of Cruachan that Angus set his love on Caer Orma of the province of Connacht and brought her away to Bruna Boyne. As to the Moragu, the great queen, the crow of battle, where she lived after the coming of the gale is not known, but before that time it was in Tewar she lived, and she had a great cooking spit there that held three sorts of food on it at the one time, a piece of raw meat, a piece of dressed meat, and a piece of butter. The raw was dressed, and the dressed was not burned, and the butter did not melt, the three together on the spit. Nine men that were outlaws went to her one time and asked for a spit to be made for themselves, and they brought it away with them, and it had nine ribs in it. Every one of the outlaws would carry a rib in his hand, whenever he would go, till they would all meet together at the close of day. And if they wanted the spit to be high, it could be raised to a man's height. At another time, it would not be more than the height of a fist over the fire, without breaking and without lessening. And Mechi, the son of the Moragu, had, was killed by Makhecht on Mag Mechi, that till that time had been called Ma Fertige. Three hearts he had, and it is the way they were, they had the shapes of three serpents through them. And if Mechi had not met with his death, those serpents in him would have grown, and what they left alive in Ireland would have wasted away. Machecht burned the three hearts on Malua, the plain of ashes, and he threw the ashes into the stream. The rushing water of the stream stopped and boiled up, and every creature in it died. 
The Moragu used often to be meddling in Ireland in Cú Cullen's time, stirring up wars and quarrels. It was she that came and roused up Cú Cullen one time when he was but a lad, and was near giving in to some enchantment that was used against him. "'There is not the making of a hero in you,' she said to him, "'and you lying there under the feet of shadows.' And with that, Cucullin rose up and struck off the head of a shadow that was standing over him with his hurling stick. That time, Concubar was sending out Finched to rouse up the men of Ulster at the time of the war of the Bull of Quelnia. He bade him to go to that terrible fury, the Moragu, to get help for Cucullin. And she had a dispute with Cucullin one time he met her, and she bringing away a crow from the hill of Cruachan, and another time she helped Talchinam a druid of the household of Connor Moore, to bring away a bull his wife had set her mind on. And indeed she was much given to meddling with cattle. One time she brought away a cow from Odress that was the household of the cow chief of Cormac Hua Quind, and that was going after her husband with cattle. And the Moragu brought the cow away with her to the cave of Cruachan and the hill of the She, and Odress followed her there till sleep fell on her in the oak wood of Falga and the Moragu awoke her and sang spells over her, made of her a pool of water that went to the river that flows to the west of Sleeve Buanya. And in the battle of Mara she fluttered over Congal Clean in the shape of a bird, till he did not know friend from foe. And after that again the battle of Cruantarv she was flying over the head of Morcha, son of Brian, for she had many shapes, and it was in the shape of a crow she would sometimes fight her battles. And if it was not the Moragu, it was Bob that showed herself in the Battle of Dunbolg, where the men of Ireland were fighting under Ave, son of Neil, and Bridget was seen in the same battle on the side of the men of Leinster. And as to Anya, that some said was a daughter of Manannan, but some said was the Moragu herself, there was a stone belonging to her that was called Cahar Anya, and if any one would sit on that stone, he would be in danger of losing his wits and any one that would sit on it three times would lose them forever. People whose wits were astray would make their way to it, and mad dogs would come from all parts of the country and would flock around it, and then they would go into the sea to Anya's place there. But those that did cures by herbs said she had power over the whole body, and she used to give gifts of poetry and of music, and she often gave her love to men. They called her the Lenin She, the sweetheart of the She. And it was no safe thing to offend Anya, for she was very revengeful. Oilil, Olam, a king of Ireland, killed her brother one time. And as what she did, she made a great yew tree by enchantment beside the river Ma and Lumic, and she put a little man in it, playing sweet music on a harp. And Oilil's son was passing the river with his stepbrother, and they saw the tree and heard the sweet music from it. First they quarreled as to which of them would have the little harper, and then they quarreled about the tree, and they asked a judgment from Oiliel, that he gave it for his own son. And it was the bad feeling about that judgment that led to the battle of Ma Macruya, and Oiliel and his seven sons were killed there, and so Anya got her revenge. Oiliel, another woman of the She, made her dwelling place in Craiglia, and at the time of the battle of Cluentarv, she sent her love on a young man of Munster, Dovlung Ua Artigan, that had been sent away in disgrace by the king of Ireland, but before the battle he came back to join with Murka, the king's son, and to fight for the gale. Oival came to stop him, and when he would not stop with her, she put a druid covering about him, that way no one could see him. And he went there where Murka was fighting, and he made a great attack on the enemies of Ireland, and struck them down on every side. Murcha looked around him, and he said, It seems to me I hear the sound of the blows of Duvlung on Argtican, but I do not see him myself. Then Duvlung threw off the druid covering that was about him, and he said, I will not keep this covering upon me when you cannot see me through it, and come now across the plain to where Oival is, he said, for she can give us news of the battle. So they went where she was, and she bade them both to quit the battle, for they would lose their lives in it. But Murcha said to her, I will tell you a little true story, that fear for my own body will never make me change my face. And if we fall, he said, the strangers will fall with us, and it is many a man will fall by my own hand, 
and the gale will be sharing their strong places. Stop with me, Doveling, she said then, and you will have two hundred years of happy life with myself. I will not give up Morcha, he said, or my own good name for silver or gold. And there was anger on Oyville when he said that, she said. Morcha will fall, and you yourself will fall, and your proud blood will be on the plain tomorrow. And they went back into the battle and got their death there. It was Oyville gave a golden harp to the son of Merda, the time he was getting his learning at the school of the Shi in Connacht, and that he heard his father had got his death by the king of Lachlan. And whoever heard the playing of that harp would not live long after it. Merda's son went where were the three sons the king of Lachlan were, and played on his harp for them, and they died. It was that harp who Cullen heard the time his enemies were gathering against him at Morhemna, and he knew by it that his life was near its end. And Mir took a hill for himself, and his wife Fuamach was with him there, and his daughter Bri and Lech, son of Keltar and Kulu, was the most beautiful among the young men of the Shi of Ireland at that time. And he loved Bri, Mir's daughter. Bri went out with her young girls to meet him one time at the grave of the daughters beside Tewar. And Lay came and his young men along with him till he was on the hill of the after repentance. They could not come nearer to one another because of the slingers on Mir's hill that were answering one another, till their spears were as many as a swarm of bees on a day of beauty. And Cochlan, Lay's servant, got a sharp wound from them and he died. Then the girl turned back to Mir's hill and her heart broke in her and she died. Lay said, Although I am not let come to this girl, I will leave my name with her. And the hill was called Bri Lay from that time. After a while, Medir, Mir took Atain Echrede to be his wife. And there was great jealousy on Fuamach, the wife he had before, when she saw the love that Mir gave to Atain. And she called to the druid, Bressel Atarlam, to help her. And he put spells on Atain, the way Fuamach was able to drive her away. When she was driven out of Brile, Angus Og, son of the Dagda, took her into his keeping, and when Mir asked her back, he would not give her up, but he brought her about with him to every place he went, and wherever they rested he made a sunny house for her, and put sweet-smelling flowers in it. He made invisible walls about it so that no one could see through, and that could not be seen. But when news came to Fuamach that Etain was so well cared by Angus, anger and jealousy came on her again. She searched her mind for a way to destroy Etain altogether. And here's what she did. She persuaded Mir and Angus to go out and meet one another and to make peace, for there had been a quarrel between them ever since the time Etain was sent away. When Angus was away from Bruna Boyne, Fuamach went around and found Etain there in her house and she turned her with druid spells into a fly, and then she sent a blast of wind into the house that swept her away through the window. But as to Mir and Angus, they waited a while for Fuamach to come and join them, and when she did not come, they were uneasy in their minds. And Angus hurried back to Brunoboyne. When he found the sunny house empty, he went in search of Fuamach, and it was along with Atarlam, the druid, he found her, and he struck her head off there and then. And for seven years Etain was blown to and fro through Ireland in great misery. At last she came to the house of Etar of Inverchechman, where there was a feast going on, and she fell from a beam of the roof into the golden cup that was beside Etar's wife. And Etar's wife drank her down with the wine. At the end of nine months she was born again as Etar's daughter. She had the same name as before Etain and she was reared as a king's daughter. There were fifty young girls, daughters of princes, brought up with her to keep her company. It happened one day, Atain and all the rest of the young girls were out bathing in the bay at Inverchechmen. They saw from the water a man with very high looks coming towards them over the plain, and he riding a bay horse with mane and tail curled. A long green cloak he had on him, and a shirt woven with threads of red gold, and a brooch of gold that reached across to his shoulders on each side. He had on his back a shield of silver with a rim of gold and a boss of gold, in his hand a sharp-pointed spear covered with rings of gold from heel to socket. Fair yellow hair he had, 
coming over his forehead, and it bound with a golden band to keep it from loosening. And when he came near them, he got down from his horse and sat down on the bank. And here's what he said. It is here Attain is today at the mound of fair women. It is among little children is her life on the strand of Ingvar Kechman. She has healed the eye of the king from the well of Loch Lalig. It is she has swallowed a heavy drink by the wife of Atar. Many great battles will happen for your sake to Ahed of Mir. Destruction will fall upon the she, and war on thousands of men. When he had said that, he vanished, and no one knew where he went. And they did not know the man that had come to them was Mir of Brile. When Attain was grown to be a beautiful young woman, she was seen by Yoki Fedlech, high king of Ireland, and this is the way that happened. He was going one time over the fair green of Brilech, and saw at the side of a well a woman with a bright comb of gold and silver, and she was washing in a silver basin having four golden birds on it, and little bright purple stones set in the rim of the basin. A beautiful purple cloak she had, and silver fringes to it, a gold brooch, and she had on her dress of green silk with a long hood embroidered in red gold, and wonderful clasps of gold and silver on her breast and on her shoulder. The sunlight was falling on her, so that the gold and the green silk were shining out. Two plates of hair she had, four locks in each plate, and a bead at the point of every lock, and the color of her hair was like yellow flags in summer or like red gold after it is rubbed. There she was, letting down her hair to wash it, and her arms out through the sleeve holes of her shift. Her soft hands were as white as the snow of a single night, and her eyes as blue as any flower, and her lips as red as the berries of the rowan tree, her body as white as the foam of a wave. The bright light of the moon was in her face, the highness of pride in her eyebrows, a dimple of delight in each of her cheeks, the light of wooing in her eyes. When she walked, she had a step that was steady and even like the walk of a queen. And Yoki sent his people to bring her to him, and he asked her name. She told him her name was Atain, daughter of Atar, king of the riders of the she. And Yoki gave her his love. He paid the bride price and brought her home to Tewar as his wife. There was a great welcome before her there. And after a while there was a great feast made at Tewar, and all the chief men of Ireland came to it. It lasted from the fortnight before Samhain to the fortnight after it. And King Yoki's brother, Alil, that was afterwards called Alil Anglanach, of the only fault, came to the feast. When he saw his brother's wife attain, he fell in love with her on the moment. And all through the length of the feast he was not content unless he could be looking at her. And a woman, the daughter of Luchthalamderk of the Red Hand, took notice of it, and she said, what far thing are you looking at, Alil? It is what I think, that to be looking the way you are is a sign of love. Then Alil checked himself, and did not look towards Attain any more. But when the feast was at an end, and the gathering broken up, great desire and envy came on him, so that he fell sick. They brought him to a house in Tefya, and he stopped there through the length of a year, and he was wasting away, but he told no one the cause of his sickness. At the end of the year, Yoki came to visit his brother, and he passed his hand over his breast, and Alel let out a groan. "'What way are you?' said Yoki then. "'Are you getting any easier? For you must not let this illness come to a bad end.' "'By my word,' said Alel, "'it is not easier I am, but worse and worse every day and every night.' "'What is it ails you?' said Yoki. "'And what is it that is coming against you?' By my word, I cannot tell you that, said Alel. I will bring you one here that will know the cause of your sickness, said the king. With that, he sent Fachna, his own physician, to Alel, and when he came, he passed his hand over Alel's heart, and at that he groaned again. This sickness will not be your death, said Fachna then. I know well when it comes from. It is either from the pains of jealousy or from love you have given and that you have not found a way out of. But there was shame on Alel, and he would not confess to the physician that what he said was right. So Fakna went away and left him, 
As to King Yoki, he went away to visit all the provinces of Ireland that were under his kingship. He left Attain after him, and he said, Goody Tain, he said, take, care, take, take tender care of Elel so long as he is living. And if he should die from us, make a sodded grave for him and raise a pillar of stone over it and write his name on it in Oam. And with that, he went away on his journey. One day now, Attain went into the house where Elel was laying in his sickness and they talked together. And then she made a little song for him and she said, what is it that ails you, young man? For it is a long time you are wasted with this sickness, and it is not the hardness of the weather has stopped your light footstep. And Alel answered her in the same way. He said, I have good cause for my hurt. The music of my own harp does not please me. There is no sort of food as pleasant to me, and so I am wasted away. And Attain said, Tell me what is it that ails you, for I am a woman who is wise. Tell me, is there anything that would cure you, that way I may help you to it? And Alel answered her, O oh, kind, beautiful woman, it is not good to tell a secret to a woman, but sometimes it may be known through the eyes. And Attain said, Though it is bad to tell a secret, yet it ought to be told now, or how can help be given to you? And he answered, My blessings be told now, or on you, fair-haired Attain, it is not fit I am to be spoken with. My wits have been no good help to me. My body is a rebel to me. All Ireland knows, O king's wife, there is sickness in my head and my body. And Attain said, If there is a woman of the fair-faced women of Ireland tormenting you this way, she must come to you here if it pleases you. And it is I myself will woo her for you, she said. Then Elel said, Woman, it would be easy for you yourself to put my sickness from me, and my desire is a desire that is as long as a year, but it is love given to an echo, the spending of grief on a wave, a lonely fight with a shadow. That is what my love and my desire have been to me. And it is then Attain knew what was the sickness that was on him, and it was a heavy trouble to her. But she came to him every day to tend him, and to make ready his food, and to pour water over his hands. And all she could do she did for him, for it was a grief to her, he to wither away, and to be lost for her sake. And at last one day she said to him, Rise up, Elel, son of a king, man of high deeds, and I will do your healing. Then he put his arms about her, and she kissed him, and she said, Come at the morning of tomorrow, at the break of day, to the house of the dune, and I will give you all your desire. That night Alel lay without sleep until the morning was at hand, and at the very time he should have risen to go to her, it was at that time his sleep settled down upon him, and he slept on till the full light of day. But Attain went to the house outside the dune, and she was not long there when she saw a man coming toward her having the appearance of Alel, sick and tired and worn. But when he came near and she looked closely at him, she saw it was not Alel that was in it. Then he went away, and after she had waited a while, she herself went back into the dune. And it was then Alel woke, and when he knew the morning had passed by, he would sooner have had death than life. He fretted greatly. Attain came in then, and he told her what had happened to him, and she said, Come tomorrow to the same place. But the same thing happened the next day. And when it happened on the third day, the same man came to meet Attain, she said to him, it is not you at all I came to meet here, and why is it that you come to meet me? And as to him I came to meet, she said, Indeed, it is not for gain or through lightness I bade him come to me, but to heal him of the sickness he is lying under for my sake. Then the man said, It would be more fitting for you to come to meet me than any other one. For in the long time ago it was your first husband, I, and your first man. "'What is it you are saying?' she said, "'and who are you yourself?' "'It is easy to tell that,' he said. "'I am Mir of Brile. "'And what parted us if I was your wife?' said Attain. "'It was through Fuamach's sharp jealousy "'and through the spells of Bressel Atarlam, the druid, we were parted. "'Will you come away with me now?' he said. "'But Attain said, "'It is not for a man whose kindred is unknown "'I will give up the High King of Ireland.' "'And Mir said, Surely it was I myself put that great desire for you on Alel, and it was I hindered him from going to meet you. That way you might keep your good name. 
and when she went back to Alel's house, she found his sickness was gone from him and his desire. And she told him all that had happened, and he said, It has turned out well for us both. I am well of my sickness, and your good name is not lessened. We give thanks to our gods for that, said Attain, for we are well pleased to have it so. And just at that time, Yoki came back from his journey, and they told him the whole story. He was thankful to his wife for the kindness she had showed to Alel. It was a good while after that there was a great fair held at Tewar, and Attain was out on the green, looking at the games and the races. She saw a rider coming towards her, but no one could see him but herself. And when he came near, she saw he had the same appearance as the man that came and spoke with her and her young girls the time they were out in the sea at Inverkechmain. And when he came up to her, he began to sing words to her that no one could hear but herself. And here's what he said. O oh, beautiful woman, will you come with me to the wonderful country that is mine? It is pleasant to be looking at the people there, beautiful people without any blemish. Their hair is the color of the flag flower. Their fair body is as white as the snow. The color of the foxglove is on every cheek. The young never grow old there. The fields and the flowers are as pleasant to be looking at as a blackbird's eggs. Warm, sweet streams of mead and wine flow through that country. There is no care and no sorrow in any person. We see others, but we ourselves are not seen. Though the plains of Ireland are beautiful, it is little you would think of them after our great plain. Though the ale of Ireland is heady, the ale of the great country is still more heady. O oh, beautiful woman, if you come to my proud people, it is the flesh of pigs newly killed I will give you for food. It is ale and new milk I will give you for drink. It is feasting you will have with me there, a crown of gold you will have upon your hair, O oh beautiful woman. And will you come there with me, Attain, he said? But Attain said she would not leave Yoki the high king. Will you come if Yoki gives you leave, Mir said then? I will do that, said Attain. One day after that time, Yoki the high king was looking out from his palace at Tewar, and he saw a strange man coming across the plain. Yellow hair he had, and eyes blue and shining like the flame of a candle, and a purple dress on him, in his hand a five-pronged spear and shield having gold knobs on it. He came up to the king, and the king bade him welcome. "'Who are you yourself?' he said, "'and what are you come for? For you are a stranger to me. If I am a stranger to you, you are no stranger to me, for I have known you this long time,' said the strange man." "'What is your name?' said the king. "'It is nothing very great,' said he. "'I am called Mir of Brileh. "'What is it that brings you here?' said Yohi. "'I am come to play a game of chess with you,' said the stranger. "'Are you a good player?' said the king. "'A trial will tell you that,' said Mir. "'The chessboard is in the queen's house, "'and she is in her sleep at this time,' said Yohi. "'That's no matter,' said Mir, "'for I have with me a chessboard as good as your own.' And with that he brought out his chessboard, and it was made of silver and precious stones shining in every corner. Then he brought out the chessmen, made of gold, from a bag that was of shining gold threads. "'Let us play now,' said Mir. "'I will not play without a stake,' said the king. "'What stake shall we play?' said Mir. "'We can settle that after the game is over,' said the king. They played together then, and Mir was beaten." And what the king asked of him, fifty brown horses be given to him. Then they played the second time. Mir was beaten again. This time the king gave him four hard things to do. Make a road over Moin Lamrade, and clear Mir of stones, and to cover the district of Tehra with rushes, and the district of Darrach with trees. So Mir brought his people from Brileh to do those things, and it is hard work they had doing them. Yoki used to be out watching them, and he took notice that when the men of the she yoked their oxen, it was by the neck and the shoulder they used to yoke them, not by the forehead and the head. And it was after Yoki taught his people to yoke them that way, he was given the name of Yoki Aram, that is, of the plow. When all was done, Mir came to Yoki again, looking at him, and wasted enough with the dint of the hard work that he'd been doing. He asked Yoki to play the third game with him. Yohi agreed, and it was settled. As before, the stake to be settled by the winner. It was Mir won the game that time, and when the king asked him what he wanted, 
It is Attain, your wife, I want, he said. I will not give her to you, said the king. All I will ask then, said Mir, is to put my arms about her and kiss her once. You may do that, said the king, if you will wait to the end of a month. So Mir agreed to do that and went away for that time. At the end of the month he came back again and stood in the great hall at Tewar, and no one had ever seen him look so comely as he did that night. And Yoki had all his best fighting men gathered in the hall. He shut all the doors of the palace when he saw Mir come in, for fear he would try to bring away Attain by force. "'I am come to be paid what is due to me,' said Mir. "'I have not been thinking of it up to this time,' said Yoki. There was anger on him. "'You promised me Attain your wife,' said Mir. The redness of shame came on Attain when she heard that. But Mir said, "'Let there be no shame on you, Attain, for it is through the length of a year I have been asking for your love, and I have offered you every sort of treasure and riches, and you refused to come to me till such a time as your husband would give you leave.' It is true I said that, said Attain. I will go if Yoki gives me up to you. I will not give you up, said Yoki. I will let him do no more than put his arms about you in this place, as was promised. I will do that, then, said Mir. With that he took his sword in his left hand, and he took Attain in his right arm and kissed her. All the armed men in the house made a rush at him then, but he rose up through the roof, bringing Attain with him. And when they rushed out of the house to follow him, all they could see were two swans high up in the air, linked together by a chain of gold. There was great anger on Yoki then, and he went and searched all through Ireland, but there were no tidings of them to be had, for they were in the house of the she. It was to the brew of Angus on the Boyne they went first, and after they had stopped there a while they went to the hill of the she in Connacht. There was a serving made with the Tain at that time. Kruachan Kroderg, her name was, and she said to Mir, Is this your own place we are in? It is not, said Mir. My own place is near to the rising of the sun. She was not well pleased to stop there when she heard that, and Mir said to quiet her, It is your own name will be put on this place from this out, and the hill was called the Hill of Kruachan from that time. Then they went to Brile, and Atain's daughter Essa came to them there. She brought a hundred of every sort of cattle with her, and Mir fostered her for seven years. And all through that time Yohi the High King was making a search for them. But at last Kotal of the Wittered Breast took four rods of yew and wrote oems on them, and through them and through his enchantments he found out that Attain was with Mir Brilech. So Yohi went there and made an attack on the place. He was for nine years besieging it, and Mir was driving him away. And then his people began digging through the hill. When they were getting near to where Attain was, Mir sent three times twenty beautiful women, having them all the appearance of Attain. He bade the king choose her out from among them, and the first he chose was his own daughter, Asa. But then Attain called to him, and he knew her, and he brought her home to Tewar. Yoki gave his daughter, Asa, her choice of a place for herself, and she chose it and made a wrath there that got the name Rathessa, and from it she could see three notable places, the hill of She in Broga, the hill of hostages in Tewar, and Dun Crithan on Bain Eder. It was great anger on Medir, Mir, and his people because of their hill being attacked and dug into. In revenge for that insult they brought Connor, high king of Ireland, that was grandson of Yohi and of Attain to his death afterwards at Tederga's inn.